Hey what's up guys, Hello Swiftful Paul Talk here. Now that we've passed the opt-out deadline and are only three weeks away from the 2020 NFL season being kicked off with the Chiefs hosting the Texans, I wanted to put out my preseason power rankings and put all 32 teams in separate tiers to tell you where do I see them heading into 2020. When I put together this list, I considered the talent on the roster, the coaching staff and what I think will be a much more important factor than it has been maybe ever simply because of the COVID situation with the amount of preparation that teams will have and the chemistry they will be able to build as a team, the continuity they have coming into the season. With that being said, this is how I would group them. First off, we have the bottom tier teams. Don't want to be too negative here since all fan bases want to have some hope at this point of the year, but somebody had to be at the end. I think all these teams are in the running at least for being fourth inside their own division. They all have clear holes in the roster and all but maybe two of them feature coaching staff that I'm not sold on or don't have the experience. What I thought was very interesting about this, what all these teams had in common, bad O-line and secondary play, to go along with questions about who they have on the center, obviously. And somebody had to be 32, for me it's the New York Jets. It's been like three years since the Jets last found themselves here, since drafting Jamal Adams and Sam Darnold as cornerstones on either side of the ball, gave me some hope that they were able to turn it around, but I just don't see them making any noise this upcoming season. They'll be without their top two players in defense now, with Jamal being traded to Seattle and TJ Mosley opting out for personal reasons, to go along with no proven edge rusher and a very underwhelming group of corners. And that was the promising unit actually for Gang Green last season, as they finished the top 10 in the yards allowed. When you go to the offensive side of the ball, the O-line to me is still full of guys that have more question marks than answers. And as much as I like second round pick Denzel Mims out of Baylor, they don't have a lot of proven commodities at the receiver position. Now they basically replaced Robbie Anderson with Rashad Perryman. They pay a lot of money to Le'Veon Bell, who didn't have a single run of 20 plus yards last season. And while he has shown some signs, Donald just hasn't developed the way I hoped he would. Even though I have to put a lot of blame on the front office and the organization as a whole to go along with the coaching staff here. If you want to find that one bright spot with the Jets, I think it's the new general manager, Joe Douglas who's already shown the ability to get some good return in the deals he makes when you look at the Jamal Adams trade, a player who didn't want to be there. And Douglas also just had a very strong first draft. I don't see this team being a major factor in 2020, and I would think Adam Gase is gone next offseason. So now for me it'll be about using the resources they have in a smart way, and if Donald shows enough to make them believe he's the long-term answer on the center, having one of those top draft picks in the QB sweepstakes could allow them to bring in a lot of talent very soon. Just ahead of them are the Carolina Panthers, and to me that's a team that actually has a new promising leadership group and coaching staff, with former Baylor head coach Matt Rule coming in and taking his defensive coordinator Phil Snow with him, to go along with Joe Brady, the former LSU offensive coordinator who called the shots for the national championship team, and Chase Blackburn actually a longtime special team standout for the Giants, and now rising name in that area of the game. If you put all that together, I think the Panthers have built a foundation that can help them put together a winning program. The issue here, I just don't know if they have to the play us for their quick turnaround yet. There's a lot to like when you look at the young receiver trio, the reigning leader in scrimmage yards in Christian McCaffrey, a lot of young talent on the defensive line, including top draft pick Derek Brown, immediately upgrading the struggling run D, and range of players in the back seven. However, while I think the numbers at the end of the season will look pretty good, I believe Teddy Bridgewater limits the potential offensively, since he just doesn't push the ball downfield in a way that threatens the defense. I'm not fully sold on their offensive line yet, and there are a lot of questions about how Carolina will look like on the back end defensively themselves. If the Panthers had above average starters at quarterback, right guard, and at second corner spot, they would be in the hunt for a Wild Cup berth. But Teddy Bridgewater, Dennis Daly, and probably Eli Apple just don't make me a believer. If they grab Trevor Lawrence and sign a top end offensive lineman next year, now we're talking. And number 30, the Jacksonville Jaguars. And according to Vegas, this is the team that is favored to earn the number one pick in the 2021 NFL Draft. I personally have them two spots higher than that, and while there needs to be some change in the organization before I'm ready to buy into them as a team on the right track, I really like some of the young talent they have on the roster. Gardner Minshew had an excellent debut campaign, considering Jackson was ready to make Nick Foles the guy there. That receiving corp to me just doesn't get the love it deserves, with DJ Chark breaking out as a star last season, D.D. Westbrook, a guy that is capable of putting up big numbers every week. And now second round pick LaVisca Chenault, tremendous upside with that guy as well. Running back Dylan Fournette to me gets better up at times, and he has a physical O-line in front of him. 
defensively, there are certainly some holes, especially when you look at that secondary. But you have Josh Allen and now Caleb on Jason. That's a pair of the edge that can really put some fear in opposing offenses. Miles Jack, very athletic play on the second level. And I love the confidence that top draft pick CJ Henderson plays for them. A guy to replace Jalen Ramsey for them, potentially a cornerback. To me, this just smells like a swan song season for Doug Marone and company. But if Jacksonville puts together a competent new regime that can use the draft picks they acquired wisely and build a culture where stars actually want to be on board, they have a chance to turn this thing around rather quickly. This year, I think they'll be a fun watch, but not win a lot of games. And at 29, the team with no real name, Washington to me, loaded on the defensive side of the ball with some young talent, especially when you look at first round picks from each of the last four drafts, likely starting week one. They have some linebackers that they like and an improved secondary. The offense, however, doesn't inspire much confidence. When you look at a first round quarterback that was pretty disappointing as a rookie, a lack of proven pass catchers, the leading rusher from 2019 now entering his 14th season as a pro, and being tasked with replacing an all pro left tackle in Trent Williams. With that being said, I could see Washington being a much more complete team than people want to give them credit for, since I think they have at least one unit ready to compete right away, and a lot of improvement offensively if only a couple of their players come through for them. Dwayne Haskins to me looked overweight and was pretty slow processing information on the field. Now he looks trimmed down a little and has had a full offseason of studying game tape to go along with new offensive coordinator Scott Turner, implementing a more suitable offense for his quarterback. At his disposal, he has a young star receiver in Terry McLaurin, some versatile backs, and outside of left tackle, a pretty underrated offensive line, I feel like. If they are at least close to average on offense, this team could be a pain in the ass just because they want to kick yours. Because they had to let Darius Geis walk, I think that was the decisive factor between the two teams in the NFC East for me, since I have the New York Giants right ahead of them. And there's a huge drop off between these two teams and the two frontrunners in the NFC East with the Eagles and Cowboys. They will come up quite a bit later. And for the Giants, it's pretty much the exact opposite. A young, interesting offense with Daniel Jones. He really surprised me as a rookie. I know he gets confused by some zone coverage looks, holds onto the ball too long at times with bodies around him, trying to knock the ball off his hands. And there were some up and down moments in year one, but he also showed me much more than I expected in big time throws, mobility, and just the potential he has. Now they've made reinforcement on the offensive line, some young pass catchers looking to take another step, Darius Slayton and Ivan Ingram, to go with the most talented back in the league and Saquon Barkley, who is back healthy himself. I think they can really put some points on the board. The question for me is, can they stop anybody? When you look at the G-Men, they didn't have a second defender with at least five sacks. Blake Namtinas is now the best linebacker, who to me is a lower tier starter himself. And as much as they've invested into the cornerback position, Right now, I'm not sure if there's a second one to go with James Bradbury worthy of starting. So I expect the defense to be near the bottom in most of the major categories, but at least they should be able to put the ball in the paint themselves to some degree. At 27, the Cincinnati Bengals, and there's a lot of positivity with this team. They seem to have finally found the franchise quarterback in Joe Burrow coming over from LSU as the top draft pick. They got a lot of guys back healthy, and they finally spent some money in free agency. So I definitely like the direction this franchise is moving, which seemed to be content with mediocrity for a long time now until they finally fell off these last two years. In terms of the skill possession talent, I think they really get overlooked, especially if AJ Green is back to 100%. The D-line rotation looks very strong now, and they completely overhauled the back seven defensively, with guys I like quite a bit. DJ Reader in particular is a guy that I think will be a huge addition for this team because of the things he can do without ever showing up on the stat sheet. So what is the big area of concern for me still? It's the offensive line. Where I seem to have the most confidence in left tackle Jonah Williams, who missed his entire rookie campaign and hasn't been on the field for a second. So there are enough pieces in Cincinnati that I could absolutely see them match the win total of 2019, which was only two, just a month into his upcoming season. But at the same time, without a normal offseason program to get the rookie quarterback ready, a lot of new players coming in altogether, not being able to establish that on field communication, I would still put them clearly fourth inside the AFC North but they might be on the right track here. And closing out this group, where I was very close to putting them one tier higher actually, the Miami Dolphins. I'm a big fan of the program Brian Flores has built already in Miami, and they won some games that they weren't supposed to last season. After starting out the year with seven straight losses, they went five and four the rest of the way, including defeating the Eagles, who were in the hunt for a division crown, and the Patriots in week 17, which cost them a first round by in the playoffs. Now the Dolphins have completely overhauled the offensive line and backfield, while having a couple of promising receivers, including Devante Parker, who averaged 100 receiving yards over the second half of 2019. 
defensively, they may not be able to stop some of the top attacks right away, but I can see a plan in what they are building with big run stoppers up front, size and versatility among the linebackers, and matchup specific guys in coverage. This will be an interesting team to follow to see when they feel like 5th overall pick to attack of Aloha is ready to start, but the difference between them and a team like the Chargers who you see a tier higher and selected Justin Herbert a spot later is that they could make a good argument they already had the top quarterback inside their own division with Ryan Fitzpatrick who quietly was one of the best at pushing the ball downfield and led 4 game winning drives. To me this just seems like one year too early for Miami. And that brings us to our next tier, the round 500 teams meaning teams that will be dancing around that 500 mark in the win-loss column. A couple of them have the potential to win 9 or 10 games, while others could see those numbers on the wrong side of the column. With all these teams, there are obvious question marks in certain areas, even though they might feature top-tier players and or coaches at others. And the first team I want to be talking about here is the LA Chargers. I personally don't think there are 10 teams in the league with a more talented roster than the Chargers. But to me, there's much of a boom or bust group as we have heading into 2020, simply because we don't know what we'll get from the quarterback position. We've seen Tyra Taylor steal the ship for teams that relied on the rushing attack and he was allowed to manage games, while Justin Herbert to me isn't ready to work complex passing concepts and read the field quite yet, but he's a top 10 pick and those guys historically see the field as rookies, especially these days. Defensively, I think they're near the top of the league when you look at a ferocious front four, that now gets some help from him while Joseph is a rock in the middle. They just boosted the second level of the defense with speed in the form of first round pick Kenneth Murray, and the secondary is pretty much as complete as it gets. Outside of left tackle, which to be fair is a huge hole, the rest of the offensive line is as good as it's been in years, and I'm so excited to see what Austin Eckler can do with more chances even now, with a complementary group of backs around him, and they have a nice mixture of pass catches. The one area of concern for me here is the depth at the wide receiver position, since their number 3 will probably be the worst among all NFL teams. So like I mentioned, a lot of this will be about what they get from the quarterback position, since the roster to me gives them a baseline of 6 or 7 wins, but they could easily earn a wildcard spot, and at the same time, if they have a losing record at the midway mark, their focus might be on giving Herbert playing time. Just ahead of the Chargers, the Chicago Bears, a franchise that I don't really hear anybody talk about unless it's a quarterback competition, I understand the Bears aren't really sexy because of the lack of superstars and offense that people recognize, but I'm high on some of the guys they have on that side of the ball, and on defense, they could be much closer to 2018 when they led the league in points allowed and turnovers forced, rather than being just inside the top 10 in most categories last season. A guy that I already predicted to break out for Chicago this upcoming season is running back David Montgomery, since he will see a much bigger workload probably to go with Anthony Miller, gadget player and young developing pass catcher, and one of the more underappreciated receivers in the game today in Allen Robinson. Defensively, I thought the biggest issue last season was missing Akeem Hicks for double digit games. He's a table setter for this group with his ability to disrupt plays, and in Leonard Floyd, he didn't provide much on the opposite side of Khalil Mack, but they just upgraded him in the form of Robert Quinn, who last season had his best year since the Rams were still in St. Louis. Now. I don't love what they have in the second safety spot to complement Eddie Jackson. Some will have to fill the second corner spot, even though I'm a fan of second round pick Jalen Johnson. And then the opt out of nose tackle Eddie Goldman, that's a huge loss for them. If the quarterback position can just complement the rushing attack and the defense plays up to the potential, this group could be definitely competing for second in the north, but Foles or Trubisky could easily hold them back as well. And right in front of the Bears, their division rival Detroit Lions, I was going back and forth between putting the Lions third or fourth in the NFC. I was going back and forth between putting the Lions third or fourth in the NFC North, but I also recently said they are among the top two teams that could go from worst to first in their division, and I would not be surprised if they were in the hunt for a wildcard spot in the last couple of weeks of the season. For quarterback Matthew Stafford, his second year in a system on the Devil Bevel, where he wasn't asked to go into shotgun 40 times a game and make matching happen. He looked like an MVP candidate as long as he was healthy in 2019. That duo of Kerryon Johnson and now a top ranked running back in draft in DeAndre Swift from Georgia, it could be one of the most dynamic ones in the league. The receiving corp to me is highly underrated, and I like the rookies they brought in via the draft competing for those two guard spots. On defense, they seem to finally have put together what Matt Patricia wanted ever since he came over from New England, in terms of being versatile with their fronts and having guys who can take on receivers and man coverage. With that being said, 
There's also a good chance that Patricia experiment could go to shambles if some of the veterans get turned off by staff coaching without having established that winning culture that Bill Belichick has in New England. And this team has simply been dealing with too many injuries to key players recently. I don't think there's much of a gap between the Lions and the Vikings, for example, but Detroit has not shown the stability as an organization of a Minnesota or some other franchises. At 22, the LA Rams, oh, how far we have come. Just one and a half years ago, the Rams kind of were officially 20 spots higher when they lost the Super Bowl to New England as that second team in the NFL. Ahead of last season, I predict them to miss the playoffs, and while it did make a bit of a run late last season, that's what ended up happening. Now, I see them as the fourth team in their own division, even though that says more about the competition they face rather than the team itself. I still believe in Sean McVay and his ability to win on paper with play design and game planning, but Jared Goff has turned out to be an average quarterback who they overpaid on. They don't have a prime talk girl he's at the table anymore, and the offensive line had some major issues for large stretches last season, especially in the run game. I was very high on the second round pick out of Florida State, running back Cam Akers, but he's obviously a rookie with shortened preparation this offseason, rather than an offensive play of the year like Gurley was for them. On defense, they have two elite players in Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey, and I like some of the other guys in the roles they have them, but overall, the high-end talent beyond those two biggest names isn't overly impressive. Maybe the biggest offseason signing, Leonard Floyd, he's probably a top edge rusher at this point, and to me he's always been more of a Robin himself. They have no proven commodity at stand-up linebacker, now that they lost Corey Lilton in free agency, and I've yet to see if Brandon Staley can be an act, and I've yet to see if Brandon Staley can actually be an upgrade over what Wade Phillip was for them as a defensive coordinator. A new team from Vegas comes in at 21. The Raiders, to me, still a team that is in transition, not only with them moving, but also in terms of the roster construction, the culture, John Gruden and Mike Mayer are trying to establish. You look at that group of receivers, outside of Tyrell Williams, they completely overhauled that group, have a lot of young pieces on the defensive line and secondary, plus they will have at least two new stars on the second level of the defense, which was the biggest area of improvement for me when I looked at them. By far, the biggest thing they have going for themselves is the offensive line and the second year back, Josh Jacobs running behind it. When I did my top 10 O-line rankings a couple weeks ago, I had the silver and black at number 5, and Jacobs was already a top 100 play in the league for me, just with how physical and elusive he is as a runner. I could easily see the Raiders finish near the top in terms of ground production, and also like some of the young guys they brought in around it, with Henry Rux from Alabama keeping the defense honest with his speed, Brian Edwards from South Carolina, physical receiver who will get the outs after the catch, and Lynn Bowden Jr. as that chess piece potentially that they can use in a multitude of ways. My bigger question here is actually if Derek Carr is willing to push the ball on the field. Defensively, I like the rotation they have on the interior D-line, and the two linebackers they brought in via free agency, with Corey Lilton who just talked about with the Rams being a major loss. To me, there are still certainly some questions about how snaps will be split with the corner group, but I'm excited to see a full season of John from Abram, hopefully. And when I think about the Raiders, they had a strong start last season because they have guys with some attitude and an energetic head coach. At number 20, the Atlanta Falcons. Some I feel like a sleeping dragon here with how much people talk about the top two teams in the South. Very rarely do you have a team that was among the worst over the first half of the season and then among the best over the second half. The Falcons started out 2019 with a 1-7 record but would go on to win 6 of the final 8 games. Their defense was absolutely atrocious early on last season with no pass rush impacting the opposing quarterback, and several miscues in coverage. But with Raheem Morris taking over defensive play calling, they already showed a lot of improvement over the second half of the season, and there are some signs that trend will continue. While there are certainly still some questions about the back end, and if they can get consistent pass rush production outside of the top two guys, I think Dante Fowler is an upgrade over Vic Beasley. I like Marlon Davidson, the second round pick out of Auburn, as a guy with some inside out flexibility and sub packages. And Keanu Neal is back healthy as the can chancellor type who can be an extra defender in the box in that system and punish receivers from catching the ball over the middle or in the flats. On offense, I believe they are still a team that can move the ball. They just have to start doing it a little earlier in games. The top receiver duo in the NFL today, I think, is in their own division with Tampa Bay. But Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley, that could easily be the next one. They did lose a very productive tight end in Austin Hooper. But I believe Hayden Hurst, who they trade a second round pick for, can replace at least 80% of that production. And while we have no idea what we get from Park Burley and his knees at this point, last year the Falcons had one of the least effective per touchbacks in Devontae Freeman. 
Plus, the offensive line should take a step forward with former first-round pick Chris Lindstrom returning from injury. So we have positive signs, but Dan Quinn has to pick it up if he wants to keep his job. And the top team of this group, the Houston Texans, it's kind of tough to put a team here that has won its division the last two years, but I think the Texans are clearly number three in the South now. I love Deshaun Watson, and I think he has fairly established himself as a top five quarterback in the NFL today. But Bill O'Brien just took away an elite wide receiver in DeAndre Hopkins and replaced him with an injury-prone Brandon Cooks to go with another always banged up Will Fuller and the declining Randall Cobb, who has had his fair share of injuries as well. Plus then they add David Johnson to the backfield, who was unrecognizable last season, just not a very dynamic player. I think the O-line is improving, but outside of Laramie Tunzel maybe, they don't have anybody other than Watson, who is clearly above average in their role. And defensively, they finished in the bottom five in yards allowed, and they tied Cincinnati, who had the first overall pick in the draft, for an NFL high 6.1 yards per play. Hopefully having JJ Watt back for a full season should help. I like the selection of TCU's Ross Blacklock on the inside, and there are some talented corners on that roster who could be much better in 2020. I would not be surprised if this is a 500 team at heart, and their quarterback carries them to a couple more wins that they were supposed to get, which he's done so many times before. But to me, it's more likely they're fighting for one of those two bottom wildcard spots. Let's move on to our middle tier here, the fringe playoff teams, meaning those are the teams who I expect to be at 500 or above, firmly in the contention for a wildcard spot at least. They may have some areas of concern, but overall they have the roster ready to compete with the big dogs and or feature above average coaching. With a couple of these, there's a change of quarterback and head coach respectively, but they have enough around those to overcome that. And it feels really weird to put this team at number 18, but that's why I have the New England Patriots. And this offseason must have been a roller coaster for the fans. First, Tom Brady leaves and everybody goes crazy. Then people start getting onto the Jared Stidham hype train and talk about how good the rest of the team still is. Out of nowhere, they signed Cam Newton for the veteran minimum, basically. And they are back in the conversation for the top teams in the AFC all of a sudden. And now, they lead the league in players opting out for the season, with key defensive pieces like Dante Hightower and Patrick Chun to go with a couple of role players on offense at least. So that is why I have them right at the bottom of these fringe playoff teams. Because purely based on the roster, I don't think they make the top 20 league wide, but I just have so much respect for the coaching staff. Probably the greatest offensive mind in NFL history in Bill Belichick. And one of the best offensive coordinators today in Josh McDaniels. Obviously, a lot of this will come down to what version of Cam Newton we get. And if he can stay healthy for a full season, not only is New England the most adaptable team, and how they can adjust to personnel and how flexible they are with their game plans and in-game decision making, but Cam is also a great fit for that offense, where they spread the field and make decisions quickly based on the defense adjusting to those formations. The one area that clearly took the biggest bump for the Patriots, outside of quarterback, I'm guessing is the offensive line, because they lost a legendary position coach in Dante Scanecchia, and the probable star at right tackle Marcus Cannon. The Patriots do have some young players that they brought in to replace some of those losses that they had, but they were already in plan for the pieces that left before there was even any virus outbreak, such as Jamie Collins, Calvin Noy, Danny Shelton, and all those other names. Just ahead of them, the Minnesota Vikings, a team that I think has been a little overhyped this offseason, no, I don't love how the Packers have operated since February, but what have the Vikings really done to improve? They traded away the best deep threat in the league last season, Stefan Diggs, stalwarts on the defensive line, like Everson Griffin and Linval Joseph are now gone. Their entire group of corners has combined for less than 1,500 career snaps, and their offensive coordinator is now in Cleveland. I'm intrigued by the combination of Adam Phelan and Justin Jefferson, one of the first round picks out of LSU, as those guys could be pretty interchangeable in their roles, and I like the 12 and 21 personnel groupings, but they like depth at the wide receiver position, and the defense will be relying on several inexperienced pieces to step in. I mean, their three starting corners from last year are off the team now, so I don't get how most people want to put them ahead of the Packers all of a sudden, but with that being said, I like the offensive scheme, and always thought Gary Kubiak was a huge factor in the success on the ground at least. Defensively, there are certainly some question marks, especially in the secondary, but Minnesota could easily have a top 5 player at their respective position in all three levels, with the Neil Hunter, Eric Kendricks and Anthony Harris. Plus, they still have some promising young guys like Ifede Odenikbo, Mike Hughes and the deep rookie class. What hurts is that the only true shade nose tackle in Michael Pierce just opted out as well. We've arrived at the midway mark with number 16, Denver Broncos. 
a team that has been getting a lot of love this offseason. They pretty much have all the pieces those rising squads usually have. Promising second-year quarterback with a lot of weapons around them, a ferocious defensive front, and they already showed some signs late last season. My belief in them has taken a little bit of a dump, unfortunately, since I thought they did well to improve their offensive line, with Garrett Bowles on the left end being the only weak spot. But now that Juwan James won't be available at right tackle for the second straight year, with an injury last season and now opting out, their two of offensive tackles is definitely a concern for me. On defense, you have to love what they have in the front seven, with Vaughn Miller and now again Bradley Chubb coming off the edges, Jarrell Casey being added to the interior to go along with Shelby Harris, and Alexander Johnson being a guy who quietly has been a very good player at linebacker for them. I've always been a big fan of Justin Simmons as well, but the second corner spot is still up in the air for me. I like Vic Fangio and that coaching staff they've put together in Denver, with Pat Shermer providing a QB-friendly offense, the game's best offensive line coach, Mike Munchak, and most of the people that have helped Fangio put out elite defense at multiple stops before this. So the Broncos, to me, still the most dangerous opponent of the Chiefs in the AFC West, but now I'm not sure if they can add some drama with the fourth quarter of the season. And another very intriguing team comes in at number 15, the Arizona Cardinals. There are certainly some issues here still, but Arizona probably is the most exciting young team in the NFL. Kyler Murray was a one-man show last season, and he's due for a big jump, with DeAndre Hopkins being added to a receiver corp that desperately lacked defendable targets last season to go from other youngsters now back fully healthy. Kenyon Drake, he's a guy who looked like a different player once he came over from Miami, and the O-line should at least be marginally better. Defensively, they've transitioned a little bit up front with those big gap-blocking guys on the line, and then Isaiah Simmons being an ultra range of play on the second level, who can run guys down on the edges if those ball carriers are forced to bounce outside. Plus, they have maybe the most underappreciated edge rush over the last four years in Chandler Jones. I don't think they're very deep in the secondary, but Buda Baker to me is an absolute baller. Jalen Thompson really emerged for them late last season, and I already predicted corner Byron Murphy to be one of those breakout guys in the second season. You look at Arizona with Cliff Kingsbury and Vance Joseph, they have some very creative play calling on either side of the ball, and now they have the personnel to execute it at the level that is needed. Like I already mentioned, I was ready to at least have the Cardinals go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Seattle for a playoff spot, but the addition of Jamal Adams for the Seahawks has shifted the balance against some degree, and if you just go based off my ranking, as you can see, I have two NFC wildcard spots already going to teams from 5-7. to seven. This kind of seems to be the segment of young promising teams, as at number 14 we have the Cleveland Browns, and I don't see them competing for the AFC North really, just because of how loaded the Ravens are. But this team pretty clearly is the most talented team that is mostly considered to be third in their own division. When you look at the group of starting skill position players at least, they are near the top 5 in the NFL. The O-line already made my top 10 rankings with room to move up. And if healthy, they should at least be in a conversation for that with the D-line as well, with the defensive player of the year candidate and Miles Garrett. And I like how they have assembled the secondary as well. With that being said, they have some unproven players at the linebacker level and Cleveland's potential is largely dependent on which Baker Mayfield will get, but with Kevin Stefanski coming in and installing an offense that will be built on the zone run game, with Nick Chubb being the best player last season anyway, and bootlegs off that, where his quarterback is put in the move, I could see much more confident in that system and efficient play as a result. Something that really jumped out to me on tape when watching the Cleveland offense was how many times Baker seemed to be not on the same page with his receivers, expecting routes to be broken off differently, and unfortunate drops in certain situations. I know the preparation for the season does look a lot different, and quarterbacks and wide receivers won't be able to spend as much time together, but still, I expect this to improve and more suitable roles for all those pass catchers overall, and if they are ahead in more games, that pass rush will be a problem. Another final team of this group, the Tennessee Titans, definitely seems a little low for a team that is coming off an AFC Championship game appearance, but all the people out there seem to forget what actually happened with the Titans last season. They were 8-7 heading into week 17, and if it wasn't for the Steelers losing the final three games, they wouldn't have even been in position to lock down that sixth seed. Things were also made a lot easier by the division rival Texans, who set most of the starters in week 17 after beating Tennessee just two weeks prior. So as impressive as the playoff run was, you have to think of what happened before that, and kind of put this all in perspective a little. With one more playoff spot in each conference now, their chances of making it to the tournament should be at least equally as good as it was last season, but I believe the Colts are the favorites to win the South, and for me the Steelers are also the favorite for the fifth seed. However, there is plenty to like still with this team. They can pound the rock with Derrick Henry in the run game, 
Brian Tannehill at least gives them the threat of pulling the ball and going deep of play action to keep defenses honest. They have some young weapons catching the ball, especially with AJ Brown last season being a stud. And defensively, they're very versatile on how to set up game plans. I really like the mindset Mike Rabel installs in the guys that he has, and I was impressed with what offensive coordinator Arthur Smith did in 2019. If there are two spots that could decide if this group is fighting for a division title or the final playoff berth, it'll be the rookie right tackle Isaiah Wilson and recently signed edge rusher Wick Beasley. And that brings us to a second group here. Fittingly put them in silver. The playoff contenders. This tier consists of eight teams who have maybe one or two holes on the roster, while the coaching staff gives them an advantage over the majority of teams in the league, and they bring back most of the pieces from a year ago, or at least improved in those areas. I expect pretty much all these squads to make the playoffs in 2020. You know how things go, maybe one or two don't. But as long as they don't suffer any significant injuries along the way, I think they're firmly in that conversation. And the first team that comes up just ahead of the division rival Titans, the Indianapolis Colts, the one team that I think could go from finishing sub-500 to making it all the way to the conference championship game if all things go well. I thought Phil Rivers had a really rough 2019 season in which his arm looked rather weak and the decision making hurt the team on multiple occasions, but he'll now be playing behind the best offensive line he's ever had and they will run the heck out of the ball. Indianapolis already had a pretty good back in Marlon Mack, but now with Wisconsin superstar Jonathan Taylor coming in, who is selected in the second round, to me he'll be one of the front runners for Offensive Rookie of the Year if he just given the chances in combination with what I believe is the best front five in the entire league. Plus, the other second rounder Michael Pittman Jr. from USC will be that Vincent Jackson, Mike Williams type target for the Rivers where he can just throw the ball up in the air. More importantly, with the trade for a top 50 play in the league in my opinion in DeForest Buckner, this entire Colts defense immediately takes a step forward since he's a perfect fit as that free technique in the front and helps them disrupt plays at a much higher rate to go along with range and the zone coverage behind that, including the maniac Darius Leonard chasing people down. Frank Reich to me a very underappreciated coach. I like the staff he has put together, but his in-game decision making, the way he can put together offensive game plans, and the intensity his team plays with, I'm a big fan of. Just ahead of them, another team from the AFC who could be a very dangerous squad, the Pittsburgh Steelers. I've talked many times about how bad the quarterback situation for them really was last season, as both Mason Rudolph and Devlin Hodges finished near the bottom in yards per attempt, percentage of throws beyond the mark, and many other categories. We've only seen Big Ben throw in some short clips on the internet, but if he's just 70 to 80% of what he was in 2018, this team is bound for a play of birth. There are some question marks with this young group of skill position players, but I expect Juju to bounce back in a major way with a capable quarterback and just being healthy himself. I've already picked Deontay Johnson as a major breakout candidate for this season, and I like the diversity of this group of backs. Pittsburgh's defense was already elite last season, as they finished top 5 in both yards and points allowed, tied for first in yards per play with 4.7, had the most takeaways with 38, and the most sacks as well with 54. A former Raven, Chris Wormley, can just replace what Javon Hargrave did as a 2 run stopper at least, and rookie Antoine Brooks can fill a very specific role as the second sub-package linebacker in place of Mark Barron. I think they'll once again be one of the scariest units in the NFL. So to me, they have the best all-around defense for my money, and an offense who I would say has top 10 potential at the very least. That's a tough matchup. Maybe not quite battling with the Ravens for the North, but the top wildcard spot for sure. Let's talk about a couple NFC teams here again, the Green Bay Packers at number 10, and the whole Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love drama, it's been looming larger over this offseason for the Packers, and that has brought up some interesting discussions, but that's not allowed us to take away from the fact that Green Bay just had a first round bye in the playoffs and made it to the NFC title game. Even though they were 8-1 in one score games and should regress more towards the mean in terms of the success rate in those close games, the North is still wide open and they have a few things going for themselves. They still have the best quarterback in the division, the best offensive line, the most versatile and effective pass rush, and a lot of young talent in the secondary. Outside of the first round selection for future signal caller, I wasn't too fond of what they did in the draft overall, even though I liked Cincinnati's Josiah Taguara and can see what he can do in terms of an H-back or move guy in this offense. I thought they did not get Aaron Rodgers enough help in the receiving corp, which just has no proven commodity outside of Devontae Adams. The Packers defense got absolutely steamrolled in two games against the eventual conference champion 49ers, but I hope to see Rashawn Gary develop in the second season, and I think Christian Kirksey was a very underrated signing as a run-stopping linebacker. 
schematically, I think Metal Fuss offense, based on what they did on the Sean McVay in Los Angeles and Mike Patton being very creative himself, they are one of the better coaching staffs in the NFC. But I would like to see the offense open up a little more for Rodgers and then on defense, break tendencies more often with their coverage calls. And at number nine, the Seattle Seahawks. I would have probably put the Hawks as the final team of this group or right at the top of the next one actually a couple of weeks ago. But after acquiring Jamal Adams, I think they've reestablished themselves as that second team in the NFC West since I had them very close with Arizona originally. I didn't love what they did in the first two days of the draft, which is somewhat of a trend for them. They lost their second best defensive play at that point in Jalevi and Clowney. I'm not sure if they've upgraded on the offensive line and we don't even know if Quentin Damba will be suspended at this point. With all that being said, Seattle has finished above 500 every single year with Russell Wilson on the center, and while I'm not a big fan of the conservative approach offensively, where they don't allow Russ to throw the ball in first downs and push the tempo a lot of times, they are one of the most effective rushing teams, and they have two lethal weapons who can catch those Russell Wilson trademark rainbow balls. On defense, there are certainly still some questions about the edge rush and the second corner spot, depending on the status of Quinton Dunbar, but Pete Carroll at least has what he most wants from any position on that team, competition. And you already saw them go to more too high looks in coverage that we are used to, telling me they'll utilize Jamal's versatile skill set more than just what they did with that strong safety in the Seattle system. Another AFC team that I like a lot, the Buffalo Bills. And for the first time in about 20 years, a team not named the Patriots will enter the season as favorites in the AFC East. And it's actually not that close for me. Buffalo made a switch last season offensively to go more 11 personnel and quick tempo with Brian Dable as the offensive coordinator moving up to the booth. This offseason, they finally got the big arm Josh Allen, a dependable deep threat in Stephon Diggs, who averaged 12.0 yards per target last season, which was the second highest in the league, which moves everybody else down one spot in the food chain. And defensively, I love what they do with Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier with those game plan specific zone coverages to go with versatile secondary to execute those a deep defensive line, and two super rangy linebackers. Even outside of the Diggs trade, I think Buffalo has made some sneaky good deals since losing their wildcard game at Houston in such heartbreaking fashion. Whether that is Mario Addison as a double-digit sack guy in four straight years, added depth on the O-line, or a really solid draft class to complement what they already had. I don't want to crown them at this point, but to me they are the favorites for the AFC's number three seed for right now, since I think the South doesn't have that clear frontrunner to win the majority of the divisional games. Alright, I've promised you the big drop-off from the New York Giants and the Washington football team to the two frontrunners in the NFC East. At 7, I have the Philadelphia Eagles. I think they actually have the better quarterback, the best defensive player among the two teams in Fletcher Cox, and a more experienced secondary than the Cowboys. However, with Brandon Brooks out for the season, and maybe the worst group of linebackers in the entire NFL, I cannot put this group ahead of Dallas even though they have come up victorious against them in the big games recently. Last year, Carson Wentz carried a group of skill position players that they took from a practice squad and a banged up O-line to a division title. This upcoming season, he will go from what already wasn't an overly dynamic receiving crew to a group of track stars, most notably with first round pick Jalen Rager and hopefully a healthy Deshaun Jackson. Plus, their second year back Miles Sanders to me is ready to emerge as a star in Philly. Defensively, they did lose some long-time stalwarts like Malcolm Jenkins and Nigel Bradham, but I love the addition of Javon Hargrave in the middle to free up the other guys to just attack upfield, and with Darius Slay now being the new number one corner, not only does it move everybody else down one spot on the depth chart, like I talked about with the receivers in Buffalo, but it also finally makes more sense for Jim Schwartz now to go to those aggressive zero blitzes, since it allows the guys to cover as well. Those two newcomers I think perfectly fit when matching up with Dallas because of an improved interior run defense and having a guy that can actually match up with Amari Cooper after he has torched those other guys for the most part these last two years. And like I said, right ahead of them, the Dallas Cowboys. When you talk about some of the most talented draws in the league, I think this team comes to mind right away, especially on the offensive side of the ball. All the Dak Prescott drama aside, now he has one of the premier receiving trios with the selection of C.D. Lamb out of Oklahoma in the draft. He still probably has a top 5 offensive line, and Zeke is looking to re-establish himself as a top tier back after looking a step slow most of last season. On defense, they are getting back Leighton Anderesh, whose energy they desperately missed for large stretches last season, and they have a very deep rotation on the defensive line, even though we don't know what we'll get from a couple of guys that were out of the league, like Alden Smith and Randy Gregory. And new defensive coordinator Mike Nolan, he will change things up a little more and get his guys into the face of opposing receivers. 
We've yet to see how much Mike McCarthy will want to have say in that offensive play calling, but I like that they retained a young and creative OC in Kellen Moore. And as far as in-game control and CEO duties go, I certainly believe McCarthy is an upgrade over Jason Garrett. With the secondary, there are definitely some questions after the loss of Byron Jones, and they also lost Travis Frederick to retirement. But I think those are things that can be overcome with the piece that they have on the roster. And something that I think should not be overlooked here is the signing of former Rams kicker Greg Zerline, who has been one of the more dependable kickers in the league after they just converted only 75% of the field goal attempts last season, which was the sixth lowest in the league. Alright, I know number 5 seems pretty high for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as a team that finished below 500 last season, but this is not just about Tom Brady coming in, rather it's the whole roster in Tampa Bay that have built around him. Mike Evans with Chris Godwin are the top receiver duo in the league, the Bucs arguably have the best tight end room in the NFL as well, and the offensive line only got better now with the superhuman Tristan Wirfs coming out of Iowa playing one of those spots on the right side. I've talked about this a lot over the offseason, looking at the match between Bruce Arians' vertical-based passing attack and what Brady is used to in terms of spraying the field and getting the ball out of his hands quicker to his playmakers. My bet would be that they go to a bit more of a hybrid between the two and they just figure things out. Maybe more important, I don't think people realize what they have put together on defense. Last season, the Bucks finished number one against the run, they forced the fifth most turnovers at 28 and tied for 60 yards per play at 5.1. Top Wolves is an excellent defensive line who now enters his second season with as much talent as he's had since his days in Arizona. We all know last year James turned it over 35 times, which was 12 more than any other player in the league, while Tom didn't even crack double digits once again and he immediately improved the situation of football awareness and overall execution. To me, this is a very dangerous squad. And that brings us to our gold tier, the Super Bowl contenders. These four, I think, are the elite teams in the NFL. They all feature complete rosters, excellent coaching, and continuity as a franchise. I think these four teams will most likely square up against each other in the conference championship games on either side of the bracket. First, we have New Orleans Saints. And it's been one of those themes for me this offseason, how loaded is the Saints roster and the fact that they need to win this year. This is the final season of Drew Brees at the helm, they are already in horrible place with the cap before it even goes down in 2021. And to be honest, a lot of their key contributors are getting pretty old now. While I have seen a significant drop off in the arm strength of Brees, other than that, I don't see any issues with his offense. The O-line is elite, Alvin Kamara now should be back to 100% as a dynamic duo for a back. And they finally found the number two receiver in Emmanuel Sanders to execute the John Payton offense. When healthy, I think the defensive line is a dominant unit. I also believe third round picks like Brown from Wisconsin gives that linebacker group some versatility. And they have a lot of experience in the secondary, including a guy that I thought would be a future star on the outside in Marshall Lattimore. Before they do anything else, they need to take care of a division rival Tampa Bay, which is a very tough challenge already. But if they can do that, they are failing the hunt for the NFC's top seed. I believe there's a lot of pressure on this group because of the cap situation, their all-time great quarterback having his version of the last dance, and just brutal playoff losses in recent years. But at the same time, they have all it takes to finally break through all the way. At number 3, to me still the top team in the NFC, the San Francisco 49ers. Obviously, that Super Bowl hangover, it'll be brought up a lot of the loser of that team. But unlike a lot of other squads coming off the big game, Yet kind of similar with the actual winners in the Chiefs, John Lynch did a great job retooling for the few losses they did have and he didn't overspend on some of the other talented guys. Kyle Shannon to me is the best offensive play call and game design in football with a diverse rushing attack and the type of personnel to match it, while Jimmy G, despite some issues that he's had along the way, is coming off his first 16 game season in his career. On defense, to me they are losing what I thought was the best defensive player in the Forest Buckner but they did replace him with a top 10 prospect in Javon Kinlaw from South Carolina. And to me, Fred Warner is a guy who is emerging as a superstar. That Seattle-based system under defensive coordinator Robert Sala may not be very complex, but the Niners do have a ferocious pass rush, fast-flowing linebackers, and a great safety tandem that allow them to be very sound in their execution and put pressure on the opposing offense, similar to what the Legion of Boom did back in the day. What is definitely a concern for me is the Debo Samuel injury, and if he's not back within a couple of weeks into the season, I might drop San Francisco a spot or two. Plus, I don't love what they have at the second corner spot. But as for right now, I see the recipe that made me predict them winning the NFC West ahead of 2019 and what allowed them to be up double digits in the fourth quarter of this last Super Bowl. 
And as you can tell, the top two teams both coming from the AFC. First up, the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore was the best team in the regular season from this past year, but the Titans handed them only the third loss of the season in a divisional round at home. They did lose what to me is a first ball Hall of Famer in Gal Marshall Yander, but outside of that, to me the Ravens have an even better roster. The reigning MVP Lamar Jackson is only entering his third year in the league and can still get better with his deep ball for example. The Ravens just added a top prospect in J.K. Dobbins from Ohio State to a backfield that already set the league record in rushing yards and some of the young receivers they have will continue to develop. Defensively, they addressed the two biggest areas of improvement in my opinion, bringing in Calais Campbell to boost their pass rush, and two guys who were top six linebackers on my board in the draft, Patrick Queen from LSU and Malik Harrison from Ohio State. They may not have as many superstar names outside of Lamar as some other teams do, but without a full offseason to prepare for it, that Greg Roman offense could be even tougher to stop if Marquise Brown becomes a more dependable deep threat, now that he's fully healthy himself. And I love how multiple and diverse defensive coordinator Wink Martindale is with his defense, combining all those different pressure looks with more versatile pieces at the front and one of the elite secondaries in the game. You add to that a rising young special teams coordinator in Chris Horton and a great motivator and in game decision maker in John Harbour, I just can't find a lot of L's on their schedule. And still, the top team in the league, the Kansas City Chiefs. We've heard this many, many times over the course of the offseason. The reigning Super Bowl champs bring back 20 of 22 stars in offense and defense combined. It's actually 19 now that Laurent Duvernay Tadif has decided to opt out. But they have the best player in the league, the most dangerous receiving corp, above average O line play, and what I believe is still an improving defense that just added some much needed speed at the second level. So at this point, I just can't unseat them. For my LSU running back Clyde Edwards Hilaire, to me will be a star in that offense. They get a couple of guys back that they missed during the playoff run on the O-line and then the secondary with Juan Thornhill. And there are plenty of young developing players on that roster still. What general manager Brett Veach has done this offseason in terms of securing Patrick Mahomes for the next decade and still opening up cap room to also sign the best defensive player in Chris Jones is amazing to me. When you look at Kansas City, the only two concerns I really have are a lack of depth in the secondary and the fact that they will have to go on the road when they face the best four teams on the schedule, Baltimore, Buffalo, Tampa Bay and New Orleans, which has me favoring the Ravens as the number one seed in the AFC and which this year means having one more game in the playoffs on the road to another Super Bowl for Andy Reid's troops, but they've not done anything to make me believe they should drop from number one. Let's give you another quick look through these teams here. Like I said, the four Super Bowl contenders, eight more teams that probably make up for at least 10 of the playoff spots in my opinion. A few fringe playoff teams, where two or three probably make it as well to the playoffs. There's around 500 teams, I would not be surprised if one of them emerges. And then the bottom tier, to me I believe five of those seven teams will definitely pick in the top five in the 2021 draft. But that is it, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, just share it with one friend who loves football the way you do. You can check out more of my breakdowns here on the YouTube channel or on my page, alusofootballtalk.com. Next week, I hope to finally put out some fantasy content with players that I like better than the current ADPs. So until then, see you later. Peace.